most everyone is uh, pleased with turnout uh, uh, yesterday on the vote and trying to vote we had for the change of the local option tax. Um, today we're going to hear from Dr. Kenneth Stone from Iowa State University, and he has some uh, interesting information for us. So, Dr. Stone. Okay, thank you. Good morning, and thank you, Bob, for inviting me, and thank all of you for coming out. I know it's uh, fairly early in the morning, and hope I have something of interest for you. Uh, anybody heard, for sure, who the Iowa State coach is going to be? <laughs> 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 I, I was watching Channel 13 this morning, and uh, they were saying they're going to offer to the assistant coaches. Anybody seen the morning news? Is there anything? Yeah, okay. We, I guess we struck out on everybody else we tried. <laughs> I was over at Mount Pleasant uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was an evening meeting, and a lot of them were there, were having drinks and so on. I said, well, now I may stay around a little bit afterward, but I don't want any of you taking photographs of me and send them into the <laughs> register. So uh, at any rate, uh, what I'm about to do here today is uh, talk about uh, some trends going on in retailing in Iowa, uh, and you might say the nation. Retailing has really changed a lot in the last several years. It's just uh, amazing how it's changed. Uh, I also do a, what I call a retail trade analysis for Fairfield and, and the county. And uh, then lastly, we'll talk about what can be done in downtowns to uh, perhaps make them better or at least keep them no worse than they are. So uh, there's a lot of charts and graphs. I heard somebody say uh, it was awfully early for statistics and so on, and that's probably right. But uh, I'll try to uh, make it as comfortable for you as I can. So uh, it takes me a while to get this thing warmed up usually on the first slide once I get it going. And, uh, so let's talk about some retail trends. And by the way, if you have any questions or comments at any time, feel free to uh, just hold your hand up and I'll ne recognize you. If we look at what's happened in Iowa with respect to uh, retail over the last several years, I'm trying to figure out a place to stand here where I won't be in everybody's way. I'm probably driving the cameraman crazy. <laughs> okay, I think this might be the best here. Um, go back to 1980 and... and um, you know that we have a pretty precise way of uh, measuring about how much money people in any one county will spend in a year's time. We compare that to the actual sales in the county to see if it has a, a net outflow, which we call a leakage, or a net inflow, which we call a surplus. And in 1980, all these blue counties had more sales than the residents of those counties would have spent, so we call that a surplus. And you can see they're scattered fairly evenly around uh, over in this part of the state. Um, Mahaska at that time was the powerhouse down here, Iowa County, Des Moines, Lee, and so on. Um, there were 25 surplus counties in 1980. All the rest of them had some degree of leakage. The uh, white counties had uh, a little leakage. The mustard-colored counties had a little more. The red counties had the most. They had over 40% leakage. There were only four of those in 1980. If we fast forward to 2001, uh, see how the map has changed. We, Still have some surplus counties, but we're down in 17 as compared to 25 before. But I think most alarmingly, perhaps, is the red counties with over 40% leakage. Now we have 32 as compared to four before. So that's a big change to have occur in just 20 or 21 years. <clears throat> if we look at uh, market share of different sized towns, uh, these are the cities over 50,000 population. There were only eight of those most of that time, Ames came into that category in the 2000 census, but uh, the eight cities of the late 70s had about 36% of the entire trade in the state, and uh, during the 80s they, and the 90s, they jumped up to as high as 46%. They're actually declining a little bit. Now, you've got a situation like in Des Moines, where um, Des Moines itself is really not doing, I mean, it's actually losing sales a little bit because all the trade's going out to uh, West Des Moines, or it's going north to Ankeny, or it's even going to Altoona now a little bit. Uh, so um, uh, we're seeing a little tapering off. But to think that the eight biggest cities in the state have nearly half the sales is also kind of alarming to me. <laughs> but that's kind of the way it's going. If we look at uh, cities the size of Fairfield, for example, um, keep in mind this chart varies between 12 and 13 percent of the market. It's vacillated in that range, perhaps the last couple of years, breaking out of the range just a little bit. Uh, so holding your own, at least, uh, which is more than the smaller towns have been doing. If we look at uh, typical of the smaller towns, 1,000 to 2,500 population, we have a whole bunch of towns that size. Uh, they were declining even in the late 70s when the state was really uh, in great shape. Uh, and then in the 80s, they took a horrible nosedive. 
And uh, for example, they went from nine and a quarter percent of all the sales in the state in 1976 down to uh, a little less than six percent in, in 2000. So that's a big change percentage-wise again. And uh, if you go to the even smaller towns, it's even worse. Many of those towns have lost 60, 70 percent of their trade during that particular time. Uh, take a look at some of the businesses. Uh, I've got these classified four ways. Declining is the first one I'll talk about. Um, probably the, uh, the worst situation of all any kind of store in the state was men's apparel stores. I must add that the state now does not classify these individually anymore. They used to until 1998. So that's the reason I'm showing you uh, to 1998. Now they just classify all clothing stores and shoe stores as apparel stores. And by the way, uh, we do have handouts of, of, the, uh, of the retail trade analysis part of this, not everything else. But, uh, and I gave a CD uh, to Bob uh, that's got everything on it. So if anybody really needs any of this, I'm sure Bob would be glad to get it for you. So. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, men's apparel. From 1976 to 1998, the total sales in the state in men's apparel stores went down 77%. Just imagine, 77%. Uh, we lost 67% of the stores. And even the ones left are doing 31% less business than they were back in 1976, if you adjust for inflation. Now, what caused that? Was it the Walmarts and the Targets that caused it, or the big malls, or what? I think it was because most people are dressed like uh, uh, several of you are, <laughs> uh, rather casually. <laughs> We've gone casual in a big way in this country, and that really uh, did in the traditional menswear stores that sold uh, suits and ties and dress shirts and all that. So uh, the ones that were able to adapt and, and switch over to the, the casual wear uh, did, did okay. Uh, in particular, the big chains, the Gaps, the Eddie Bowers, uh, the Old Navy's uh, chains like that have done great because they sell casual wear to the entire family. Uh, here's, there are still some around in Ames. Uh, we have uh, two uh, menswear stores. They're both downtown. They're none of them all. When I first came to Ames in 19... Uh, 76, there were, I think, three men's clothing stores in the mall. None any longer. Uh, but there are two downtown. They mainly sell to the graduates who are getting interview suits. <laughs> and we have a fairly good sized professional uh, group of people in town. But uh, even they, I'm told, are struggling. So uh, drug stores, another type of store that's declining. And this is really an anomaly. If you look at sales, uh, it looks like if you don't adjust for inflation, they're going up maybe. When you adjust for inflation, they're actually going down. These are drug stores now. Now, why would that be? Uh, this state is getting older, as is most of the country. Older people consume more pharmaceuticals. We're developing more pharmaceuticals all the time. It's a growth industry, so why would the number of drug stores be going down and the sales in drug stores be going down? What do you think? <laughs> Partly. Yeah, uh, partly mail order, but the big thing is every Walmart has, not everyone, uh, most of the Walmarts have one, big high vs and so on have them. A uh, big share of the uh, pharmaceutical business is being done out of those big uh, mass merchandise stores now. Uh, if you take a look at what's happened to just the drug stores per se, uh, the sales in them are down 33% during that 24-year uh, period, and uh, we lost 70% of the drug stores, and even the ones left are doing 20% less sales than they were back in 1976. So uh, an awful lot of it goes, as I say, to the Walmarts, the uh, Targets, the Hy-Vees, uh, stores like that that are uh, one-stop shopping type stores. Uh, then another category is consolidating businesses, grocery stores being an example of that. It appears that grocery store sales are going up, but if you adjust for inflation, they've actually been going down. And to summarize it, total sales during that, uh, well, this is a 21-year, or 25-year period, uh, they actually declined 17%. Now, what's the deal on that? We have to eat, don't we? Population hasn't declined very much. Why would grocery store sales, if you adjust for inflation, go down 17%? Yeah, we're eating out more is the main reason. But little by little, the, uh, the Walmart supercenters are coming in, for example, and they are selling a lot of groceries. <laughs> and uh, they are counted as a general merchandise store. We don't really know how much groceries they're selling. Uh, but it's taken away from the regular grocery stores. Uh, so uh, we've lost 52% of the grocery stores. We're down something over 1,000 grocery stores compared to 1976. But the ones left are doing 65% more sales per store. Some of the high vs are 65 and 70,000 square foot today, for example. So 
you're bound to do a lot more business than back 25 years ago when we had 8,000 square foot stores. So that's what's happening in groceries. Uh, here's, um, this was a great independent grocery store in Ankeny, Dillo's Super Value. Closed a year after the Walmart Supercenter opened there. Um, he just, he was quoted in the register saying there's just too many stores for no more people than we have, and he was right. Uh, hardware stores, peers, sales appear to be going up, but if you adjust for inflation, they're actually going down. Uh, we, sales were down 44% in hardware stores during that 25 year period. We lost 48% of the hardware stores, however, the ones left are doing slightly more business per store. Uh, here's one in Ames that uh, after Lowe's came into town, uh, they had, cars had two stores at that time, they closed the downtown store, a couple other hardware stores in town went out of business, uh, they struggled. They finally uh, sold to a small chain based out of eastern Iowa here, actually. And uh, so it is still open, but the hardware business in Ames is a mere shadow of what it was before Lowe's came into town. Uh, shoe stores, another uh, consolidating type business. Sales are going down. In fact, they've gone down 35% in the last 25 years. We lost 40% of the shoe stores, but the ones left are doing about 10, uh, about 6% more business per store. A good example, one in Ames, and, and then some saturated businesses. Uh, this is uh, used merchandise, which would be antique stores. It's, it's a growing category, it grew 13% during that time, but we had 138% growth in the number of people that came into the business. So that means you're saturated and uh, the stores are doing 52% less business per antique dealer than they were back uh, 24, 25 years ago. Auto parts uh, is a growing category, up 23%, but we had a 67% increase in the number of stores that came in. Consequently, the average sales per store is down 29%. So uh, then the growing business is the last category. Uh, auto repair is growing up 60% during that time, but we had a 42% increase in the number of stores, but that was enough to avoid saturation, and the average store is uh, doing 9%. More so that's a growth category. When, when the number of firms is not outrunning the ch change in sales, you're going to have a, a growth type situation. Uh, tire stores, for example, uh, fall in that category. Or service, they do a lot of service actually. Then uh, building maintenance is the fastest growing business in the state of Iowa. What do you suppose that is? Building maintenance. Older building. Pardon me. Older building. Uh, not really. Yeah, it sounds like it, but. Uh, uh, how about people that do janitorial work and custodial work? Uh, what we got is a lot of people, a lot of big companies like in Des Moines are outsourcing. Instead of having people on their payroll that do the janitorial work, they're contracting with small firms outside. They have big savings for them, apparently. So you can see uh, the kind of growth they've had in real terms there. Uh, the sales in that category have grown 1,700%. Number of firms have increased. Now keep in mind this from a very low base has uh, increased 1,258%, and the average sales per firm is up 31%. So it doesn't sound very glamorous, but I happen to know a couple of people that are in this business, and uh, they just hire a lot of people to do the work for them, and they do a good job of supervising. It's a pretty good business. Uh, they've been making pretty good money at it. Okay, uh, eating and drinking also falls in that category. Uh, we are eating out more, as we said. Real sales have gone up. Real sales have gone up 28% during the last 25 years. Number of firms have gone up 13%. So that means the average sales per firm has gone up 9%. That doesn't mean everybody's gone up 9%. That's, that's an average. Main Street, uh, Ames has got pizza place that's kind of unique, doing pretty well. Then outside forces that are affecting Iowa retailing. Major new shopping malls such as Coral Ridge. Anybody think they've had any impact on Fairfield or not? Um, we've got five anchor stores, 1.2 million square feet. Uh, we've done quite a little work analyzing it. Uh, if you look at general merchandise, which would be the department stores, uh, that would be uh, the Yonkers, the Dillards, but it also includes Walmart, uh, Kmart, Target, and so on. Uh, the net increase after three years to Johnson County in that category was 54, 55 million. Keep in mind, they pulled some stores out of Iowa City into Coralville when this happened. Uh, Lynn County took a pretty good hit, down 16 million. Scott County was down 25 million. Now these don't necessarily add up completely because some of this is going elsewhere, but um, there are a lot of negatives. Uh, all these, I think all surrounding counties had a decrease uh, in, in sales, so to speak, uh, during that 
particular period of time. Next is apparel, that would be your clothing stores and shoe stores. Net gain to Johnson County was 35 million. Look at Iowa County, and a net drop of 19 million. What's in Iowa County? Yeah, factory outlet mall. Uh, they really took a hit, and because mainly what they sell is apparel, and they sell a lot of other stuff, but mainly apparel. Uh, if you look at specialty, which would be card and gift shops, or sporting goods, or jewelry, things of that nature, uh, Johnson had a net gain of 23 million. Um, about 8 million came out of Lynn County, it looks like. I, I should be looking at you folks. Uh, it looks like maybe, you can't say for sure that uh, the reduction, uh, the, the loss of 1.5 is due to that, but uh, good, good chance that it was. And then total sales, the net gain to Johnson County was 228 million. Net loss to Iowa County was 43 million. And they got a local option sales tax there, so uh, these local option sales taxes aren't certain. I'm really glad you passed yours, by the way. Uh, it sounds like it's a, gr a great project. But just to show you how uncertain they are, um, Polk County, for example, passed the local option sales tax for schools, and they're getting uh, nearly $1,000 per student per year, and they've got all plans to spend that plus a bunch more. And at the same time, now they were building a new mall by General Growth uh, that built uh, Coral Ridge. Uh, they're building that in West Des Moines. Again, 1.2 million square foot with a whole bunch of other outbuildings. Uh, that out, that, and it's in Dallas County. <laughs> and that uh, mall complex has the potential for uh, actually a sales of about 500 million a year. If and when that mall opens, it's going to pull a lot of sales right out of Des Moines. So uh, that certainty that they thought they had on the local option sales tax is going to be reduced a good bit. So anyhow, uh, just an aside there I thought you might be interested in. Um, what was the impact of Coral Ridge Mall on, uh, whoops, I need to go back here just a second. Impact on um, Iowa City and Coralville. The yellow line here is Iowa City sales in general merchandise, in other words, department stores. They started off here at about uh, 65 million in 1990 before the mall went in, and they were growing pretty nicely. The green line is a trend line through there. In other words, they would have been up here probably had the mall not come in. Here's when the mall came in, and here's what happened to Iowa City's uh, department store sales. Here's what happened to Coralville's department store sales. And you can see, uh, there's no doubt about when the mall came in, is there? <laughs> uh, right in there, I'd say. <laughs> Um, apparel sales. Uh, Iowa City wasn't setting the world on fire, but their trend line was along about here. And once the mall came in, it dropped down to here. Here's what happened to Coralville's uh, sales in apparel, up almost $50 million, from practically nothing to nearly $50 million. Uh, if you look at specialty stores, again, the card and gift shops, sporting goods, and so on, the yellow line was what was happening in, in uh, Iowa City. Extended on out, here's where it probably would have been. Here's where it actually ended up, and here's what happened to Coralville. They went up uh, from about 25 million up to 60 million. And uh, total sales, this kind of distorts. Actually, what happened in Iowa City, they had some countervailing things. They were, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. They had some uh, very strong sales in building materials and a couple of other categories, uh, home furnishings, that kind of offset the losses that they had in apparel and, and general merchandise. So, Iowa City overall doesn't look so bad, except if you look at the scale there, that's down about $50 million compared to where it would have been. But look what happened to Coralville. It went up from uh, 100 and, uh, I'm going to say 180 million up to nearly 400 million. So uh, malls have impacts. Yes, sir? I just wanted to ask you guys, do you have a way to track mail order and internet? Signal? We really don't. Uh, all we know is nationally about how much they are. The uh, uh, the web sales, internet sales, are the fastest growing format in retailing today. However, uh, to put it in perspective, they're still a very small percent, something uh, hovering around, it's around 1% now. Uh, keep in mind that the entire retail sales in the country are around $3.5 trillion this past year. So we got something around $100 billion, uh, we think, for internet sales. That sounds like a lot until you put it into perspective in the context of $3.5 trillion. So, yeah. Like that, uh, yeah, we have no way of, uh, oh yeah, there's no question what certain categories the internet is doing huge sales, uh, books for example, Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com and so on, both of those gadgets on that table right there uh, I bought over the internet. Uh, at the time I bought the projector, I could not buy a projector like that in the state of Iowa, but they were widely available on the internet. 
Um, so, um, travel. I don't know if we have any travel agents in here this morning, but a huge amount of travel is being done over the internet now. So certain categories lend themselves quite well to doing business over the internet. Some have not proved out too well. I think as time goes on, we get the kinks ironed out. It's going to take off and, and be uh, much stronger than it is today. It's growing faster than any other category, but it's still relatively small. Have no way of tracking it at this point. I do believe we're going to find a mechanism, however, to tax it, Let's put sales tax on. Um, uh, in this era of, of high technology, is, it seems to me there's no excuse for not, well, this is my opinion, you may disagree, <laughs> but uh, it seems to me, uh, I mean, the way the federal law is right now, if the company you're buying from does not have a retail outlet in your state, you don't have to pay the sales tax, and they don't have to collect it. They can tell you you're obligated to send the use tax into the state, but I don't know how many people do that. <laughs> not very many, I don't suppose. But um, even though the sales tax laws are different in every state, and some states don't even have a sales tax, it seems to me like it would still be fairly easily, fairly easy to uh, collect sales tax and rebate it back to the state. Because in some states, it's a pretty fair percent of the, this being, okay, <laughs> that's my sermon for the day. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, just some summary of the Coral Ridge Mall impacts. If we take general merchandise, the department stores, we think the mall did 116 million. Uh, I think that was uh, 2001 sales. Two million came out of Coralville, 26 million came out of Iowa City, 35 million from that first tier of counties around the, uh, Johnson County, another 36 million from the second tier, and then 17 million from elsewhere. Uh, just a way of summarizing where it all went. On apparel, 47 million came out of, uh, the mall did 47 million, one million came out of Coralville, 10 million out of Iowa City, 29 million out of first tier counties, 5 million out of second tier, and 2 million from elsewhere. Uh, specialty stores, 36 million to the mall, 6 came out of Coralville, 5 out of Iowa City, 8 out of first tier counties, 3 second tier counties, and 14 million from elsewhere. Uh, by the way, that Shields All Sports is classified in that category. It's a, it's a specialty store. Uh, total sales, I think the mall did 240 million, 12 million came out of Coralville, 41 out of Iowa City, 89 million out of first tier counties, 27 million out of second tier counties, and 71 million from elsewhere. So even though no one store out in Jefferson County may see that much difference, if it takes a little bit from this one, a little bit from that one, in total it adds up to these kind of numbers, which are pretty big numbers. <laughs> uh, just, uh, if anybody been to Old Capitol Mall lately? Uh, I just uh, made a point of going there here a while back and taking a few photographs. and. It looks like a morgue to me. <laughs> uh, maybe it looked like a morgue before, I don't know, but uh, uh, there's the second floor. Uh, again, the second floor. Uh, first floor, I thought that's kind of interesting. Uh, welcome to your downtown. And <laughs> this, was, I guess this used to be pennies, somebody told me, is that correct? Uh, um, and then uh, the factory outlet mall at, at uh, Williamsburg. Um, here's the year before the factory outlet mall came in. This is surplus or leakage for the county. And you can see how this, it jumped from a leakage up to a $28 million surplus about the first full year. Got up to about $38 million, started declining, and then they enlarged the mall, as I recall, and it jumped back up to $43 million surplus. And this is the year the mall opened in Coralville. And look how things went after that. We're back down to leakage for Iowa County again. Um, it's hard to get far enough away to take a picture of that whole complex, but I tried. <laughs> and then uh, I've just taken this picture to try to show the interior of the mall, what it looked like, and after I got the photograph developed, or I'm not, I guess I took it with my digital camera, I'm not sure, but at any rate, I got to noticing, my gosh, there's a lot of vacant parking spaces around there, a lot more than there used to be, so, so that's kind of, uh, in, in Iowa, uh, retailing is pretty much a zero-sum game. If a mall comes in and does $240 million a year, it doesn't come out of thin air, it, and little by little, it's got to come from various other places, uh, various other competitors. <coughs> I'm told that Lindale Mall is, uh, has um, suffered greatly and that it's being redeveloped. Is it bankruptcy? I think I heard it was in bankruptcy. I'm not sure, so uh, I don't know about that. I know an assessor called me, an appraiser called me, I'm sorry, because he was reappraising it because of going to be redeveloped, he said. <laughs> um, okay, the big box uh, d discount department stores uh, like Walmart and Target have certainly had a big impact. A lot of you know I've studied uh, Walmart rather extensively, been all over the world talking about it. Uh, Duffy in the Des Moines Register a few years ago had this cartoon. I, 
may not be completely apropos, but it, I think it illustrates what's going on with retailing in the United States, and not only retailing, but perhaps banking and agriculture and you name it. Um, in the capitalistic economic system, the big get bigger and the weak fall by the wayside. And these four, poor little neighborhood store fish <laughs> are swimming like crazy, trying to do their old thing, trying to keep from getting eaten alive, but right behind them are the bigger chain stores and so on, and behind them are the mega malls. And uh, if, if they, in a, in a place like Iowa, uh, the way they grow is by grabbing up market share from the ones that don't make it. So uh, maybe not quite apropos, but it looks pretty decent to me. And then uh, another cartoon I found was um, the Great Walmart of China. This is, anybody been to China? I was there a year and a half ago. Uh, I had a chance to go to the Great Wall. I didn't show, I did some se several seminars there. I didn't show this slide in China because uh, <laughs> uh, some Chinese are saying, sometimes I wonder if opening our economy is such a good idea. And they are privatizing, by the way, a good bit. So Walmart's apparently taking over the Great Wall of China. Uh, just if you haven't paid any attention to Walmart lately, uh, Sales of 246 billion this past year. Uh, they're far and away the biggest retailer in the U.S. Home Depot uh, is a distant second. Kroger, Target, on down to J.C. Penney, Kmart just coming out of bankruptcy at 33 billion. Um, if you compare them to all corporations, Walmart's still the biggest, head of General Motors, Exxon, Ford, and so on. If you compare them to all corporations in the world, they're still the biggest. So uh, they are big. They're having a huge impact on retailing around the world. If you look at what they're doing in groceries, uh, I'll never forget in 1990, I was invited to speak to the National Grocers Association. And I thought, you know, I know Walmart's coming on with super centers. They just opened one down at Kirksville. And I thought, I'll spend a day down at Kirksville and take a look at that. So I did, and I was so impressed that when I spoke to these folks, I said, you better keep your eyes on Walmart. They're developing these super centers. And all these grocers just laugh, ha, 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 that's the funniest thing they ever heard of. Walmart and groceries, you know, they're not laughing anymore, I'll tell you. Um, as of uh, 2001, uh, Walmart was the leading grocer at 11% uh, market share. Now they're uh, close to 13 already at this time. We're standing here this morning. Look what happened to Kroger. They were growing, and then as Walmart came on strong, they leveled out. Albertsons is second biggest, but they're declining. Safeway is growing slightly, but a, a distant fourth, I guess you'd say. Um, if you look at some market share in certain markets, uh, in the Springfield, Missouri market, Walmart has 32% of the grocery market already. One third of the grocery market. Memphis, they have 24. Des Moines, they had 12. This was uh, December 2, 2001. Right now in Mar Des Moines, they have 17%. They've grown from 12 to 17% in just two years, basically. Uh, if you look at the uh, Kansas City market, a highly fragmented market, uh, Walmart's ahead of Hy-Vee already become number one. Hy-Vee's number two. Um, a whole lot of uh, others in here, several more I didn't even show. Uh, if any of you are familiar with all these, they kind of, they're not big, but they do hold pretty much a steady 2% market in the, share, in the markets that they're in, market share. Uh, okay, uh, any questions about the preliminaries? That was just some trend stuff. I'm about to ready to talk about what you really came for, I suppose, to see what, what's happening in the Fairfield and, and Jefferson County. Uh, any? It's pretty obvious. Analysis so far that the term that's used in economic development of creating sales uh, is a myth. It, it is. <laughs> the same thing holds true when people talk about creating jobs. Uh, Bob and I were just talking about that a little bit this morning. Uh, again, it, it's kind of a chicken and egg type thing. Our population is not growing much in this state, and it's in particular the population group from up to age 44. It's actually declining, and, and that's the prime age that you need people to go into, the, I mean, say from 18 to 44. That would be uh, people entering the workforce or in the workforce already, fairly new to the workforce. And that category of population is going down, so that's not attractive to outside companies coming into the state. On top of that, we have a very low unemployment rate in this state, uh, something on the order of 3.7 now. We typically are near the bottom and uh, among the lowest in this country. Um, I'm not sure that you can buy jobs. <laughs> uh, we're putting 30 million apparently into Transova up in, in um, uh, Sioux Center, Iowa. Boy, that, that's a lot of money. <laughs> I'm not sure you'll get that back, but. I'm just Ken Stone, I don't really know for sure. So uh, I, I give the governor and the legislature credit for trying 
but uh, Bob and I were talking, the real entrepreneurs I know around the state, and we have a lot of genuine, fantastic entrepreneurs in this state. Most of them have not got any help from anybody. They had great ideas, and they just went after them and, and did it. <laughs> um, but I don't know, maybe I'm completely, maybe we can do some good, but uh, uh, we're talking 300 and some million, I believe we're gonna, it, of course the bill's still being negotiated, but that's a lot of money, I don't know <laughs> what, uh, how you dole that out and, and how it's fair and, and so on. Um, the short answer is I don't know the answer to your question, but I'm just kind of uh, ruminating about what I, uh, my feelings are on it. Uh, anybody else have any feelings on it? Can we, can we buy jobs or not? I don't know. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, there was an article. buy jobs, you mean bring people from out of state into state? Or get companies that agree to come in and uh, oh. you give them a bunch of money to come in. Uh, I, did anybody see the article? On the, there's a front page article of Sunday's Register about two weeks ago. How the state had put 12 million into two out of state companies, and then private investors had put a bunch more in, and they promised all these jobs, and there was a net gain of three jobs, I believe. <laughs> uh, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir? Well, it seemed if you had a, uh, a retail service that was a national service, you could certainly not have a zero sum game there. That's true. And if you had a manufacturing operation, the same, same concept. Mm -hmm. Right. You're not competing with your neighbors. You're basically right. competing with the national or the world market. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I would say uh, one thing I would caution those of you affiliated with the chamber in the city uh, is about trying to uh, offer incentives to retail. Um, I can see offering incentives perhaps to, to uh, industrial jobs. You're usually competing against other states typically. But when you give a few million dollars to get a big retail store into your town, for example, and I've known several cities that have done that, and the reason they do is because the city government, the council, and so on are so anxious to get some kind of economic development that they're willing to pay Walmart or whoever uh, five million, I've known figures as high as 10 million to get them to come to your town, but what, what are we really doing here? taking taxpayers' money to give to a big company that probably doesn't really need it. <laughs> and, uh, but we don't offer any similar things to our existing merchants, and, and there's a real equity problem in something like that, I think, so it, they, it needs to be thought about a good bit, I believe. Anybody else want to chime in on this? Okay, let's talk about the retail trade analysis. So if we look at Fairfield over the last uh, 20 some years back in 1976 sales were about 35 million dollars the white line is has not been adjusted for inflation you can see a little setback here in the late 80s looks like pretty good growth in the 90s um, I'm not sure what happened here uh, we might be able to see in a little bit as we go further into this uh, in real terms uh, probably pretty much holding steady uh, if we look at the number of businesses you've grown a lot of businesses in Fairfield we use 76 as the base, uh, you've got about uh, 60, about 70% more businesses now, retail businesses, than you had in 76. Probably smaller for the most part because the average sales per firm has actually gone down. So probably a few of the big ones that are no longer here were replaced by several small ones who are not doing as much sales uh, in total as what the big one was doing. If we look at sales by quarter, this will all be in your handout uh, in case you want to look at it in more detail. The red quarter here is what I call the Christmas quarter or the holiday quarter. That's October, November, December. Maybe if I can just uh, kind of, let's look, focus on 2002 fiscal year. This first quarter here is the Department of Revenue's first quarter. That's April, May, June, and that would have been of um, 01, actually. And then uh, here's July, August, September. That would be the fall quarter, that blue-green line. It's really hard to see, I know. The red is what I call the Christmas or holiday quarter. And then this is a winter quarter. This is January, February, March of 2000. And this red bar, the, the Christmas quarter, should be the best, and typically is in bigger cities. What we're seeing today is though, a lot of our smaller towns uh, in the 5,000 to 6,000 range, that's no longer the best quarter. And why do you think that is? Yeah, the, the, apparently they're leaving town to go shop for the big holiday seasons and so on. So uh, you've managed to hold up pretty well. Here's a couple years where it wasn't the best quarter, but uh, in general, it sticks out as being the best quarter in Fairfield. 
If we look at um, adjusted for inflation, you can see a little drop off, then it'll come back, maybe a slight drop off in the last couple of years. Uh, compared to a few other towns around, here's uh, Ottumwa. Back in 76, a little less than 100 million, ending up at uh, 275 million in, in 2002. The white is Fairfield, uh, starting off the, boy, Fairfield, Mount Pleasant, and Washington are neck and neck here back in 1976 at about, I'm going to say, uh, 35 million dollars perhaps. Uh, Fairfield came out the leader at, after we got to 02, up to about 100, and I'll, I'll get these exact figures in a moment, but I'm going to say 110 million perhaps. Uh, Mount Pleasant's uh, kind of dropped off, but kind of came back slightly behind you, but uh, Washington's dropped way off. When I first, yes, sir. What would you attribute the, uh, the stronger increase in the tumble in terms of the slope? Of oh, uh, no question, the mall that came in in 1990 or 1989, yeah. Uh, and the affiliated businesses on the west side there at 34. That, uh, you, you, uh, at, when I first came to the state, um, Oskaloosa was uh, really the regional rate, retail center for that part of the state. And the tumble was really quite weak. Uh, but after uh, that complex opened up, it went the other way. And when I first came here, uh, Washington was really quite strong for a town of its size. But it has, it's just too close to Iowa City and all that's going on up that way. And so it's, it's dropped off a good bit, as you can see. Um, again, this is just adjustment for inflation. When you do that, uh, there's some gradual growth there, it looks like, in the last few years. And if we uh, do it on a per capita sales, take your sales and divide by the number of people in town, this is a better measure of what's really going on. Uh, again, we see uh, three, uh, all but Washington, right there together in 2002 at about uh, uh, just short of $12,000 sales for every person in town. Statewide average is around 10000 or a little less. So obviously, uh, all three towns are pulling from beyond the town boundaries by a good bit. Uh, on the other hand, Washington ended up a little less than, it's just about average for the state. Uh, you take the pull factor, which is something I developed at Iowa State back several years ago. It's the town's per capita sales divided by the state per capita sales. So if a town had $10,000 sales for every person in town, and let's say the state average is $10,000, you divide by 10,000, what would the answer be? Divide 10,000 by 10,000 be one. And the meaning would be that if that were true, that town would be selling to the equivalent of everybody in town in full-time customer equivalents. Now, we know in all towns, some people leave to go shop somewhere else, some people come in. It's like netting it out, it'd be the equivalent of selling to everybody in town. So they're shooting for at least 100%, but you might have 150% or 1.5, um, and that's good. But uh, so let's take a look at Fairfield. Back in 76, uh, you had a pull factor of about 1.2, selling to 120% of the town population. Held pretty steady for a while, kind of came down, zigzagging around a little bit. Actually, all three of those towns, except for Washington, ended up with uh, at about 120%, I'm going to say, uh, which is, you'll see in a minute, is, is um, about average, I guess. Okay, let's look at some categories then. Uh, this is building materials. This would be lumber yards and hardware stores. Uh, the top set of bars is for 2001. The bottom set is for 2002. The top green line is the expected sales. In other words, we're comparing it to other towns of your size in the state, making adjustments for income. So we're saying if you were average for towns of this size, you'd, you'd have $3.6 million sales in building materials. In fact, in 2001, you had $3 million. So that was about a $590,000 leakage, we call it, uh, in, 19, in 2001. And then in 2002, uh, that expected sales went up a good bit. Uh, can be, well, probably because more and more people are buying at the Lowe's and the Home Depot, so that's jumped the average up. But it may have been another town or two entered the, this category. Uh, various things can cause that expected sales to go up. So we'd expect 4.3 million, you did 3.6, which is a pretty good increase actually, about $600,000 increase from 2001 to 2002. But it's still a leakage of about $70 million compared to other towns of your size. If we look at general merchandise, that's the department stores, it would include Walmart, Dollar General, those types of stores. We expect 18 million, you did just almost 18. Very slight leakage in 2001 of $6,000, uh, $6, I guess. 
Uh, in 2002, that expected sales jumped up to 19.6 million. You did 18.6, which is a nice increase, but it didn't keep up with what was going on in that category. So now the leakage is one point, uh, slightly over a million. The reason this is so important is department stores and grocery stores are kind of the equivalent of anchor stores in a mall. They are the big draws to your town. And if they're weak, uh, you're going to have people leaving. You're going to, you're not going to draw people in as you should. So uh, this is an important category, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go further. The food stores are, appear to be very strong in grocery stores. And I must say, we don't know exactly what the grocery stores are doing. We know what the taxable amount was, and, and we know statewide what the taxable amount is percentage-wise, so we're assuming your percent's the same, but uh, we may be off a little bit. But generally, we're pretty close. So we, if you're doing average, you do 19 million. Uh, according to our figures, you did 34 million. And so I'm guessing that uh, you have, as I drove around town last night, I saw not only the high V and, and uh, the Econo, but um, aren't there some smaller, especially? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, uh, so I, I think probably we're seeing some of that in here, probably. Uh, at any rate, uh, that's a big figure. It means 14.6 million better than expected for towns of this size in 2001. In 2002, uh, expected jumped up to 21 million. You did 35.5, which is up a good bit from the year before. Um, and the surplus is slightly less because of the expected sales going up. So that's a good category. So you've got at least half of the equation you need. Uh, the food part is great. The general merchandise is a little weak at this point. Apparel, it'd be all clothing stores and shoe stores. We'd expect 1.35 million. You did 760,000 in 2001, so that's a leakage of 590,000. 2002, we expect the same amount, 1.35 million. You did exactly the same. <laughs> and uh, the rounding errors here are, are, cause this to be slightly different, $580 million. Uh, $580,000 leakage in 2002. Uh, home furnishings, would, and something happened here, I'm not quite sure what. This would be furniture stores, major appliance stores uh, primarily, carpeting stores. Expect 2.5 million, you did 1.9, so a leakage of 650,000. But in 2002, the expected went up to 2.6, but the actual sales dropped off to 640,000. Did, did a store leave? Okay. That must be it. Yeah, that must be it. Uh, so uh, you can see it. Uh, now you're two million less than expected in that category. So um, eating and drinking places, we expect the restaurants and taverns. We'd expect 9.2 million. You did 7.9. That might surprise you because as I drove around last night, I saw a, a, quite a nice and varied assortment of restaurants. But uh, that's 1.24 million less than expected. <laughs> In 2002, we expected 9.6 million. He did 7.6, and that's a bad sign because it dropped, and that's a two million dollar leakage at this point. So uh, there's some, certainly some opportunity in that category, I would say. Uh, especially stores, as I said before, uh, you can get the whole list of stores in this handout that we'll give you when you leave. But it, it's sporting goods stores, card and gift shops, jewelry stores, uh, uh, a lot of stores like that. We would expect 5.3 million. You did 11, which is way above average, uh, by about 5.8 million. And about the same in uh, 2002, we expect 5.6. You did nearly 12, uh, up nearly a million dollars uh, during that year. So a surplus of 6.3 million. So typically, if you're not very strong in general merchandise, in other words, if the department stores are weak, this is going to be stronger. If the depart department stores are strong, this is likely to be weaker because they a lot of times sell some of the same stuff. Uh, services, which would be everything from beauty shops to um, auto repair, bowling alleys, theaters, but motels would be the biggest one in this one. We expect 10.5 million, you did 15.7, so another good category for you. That's 5.2 million better than average. Uh, in 2002, we expected 10.9 million, you did 16.1, which was an increase over the previous year, and the surplus is about 5.3 million. Uh, wholesale is a hard category to analyze because it's um, any wholesaler or manufacturing firm is selling something like a, in an outlet store or something, or it can be a farm machinery dealer, just the parts and service in a farm machinery dealer. Very difficult to analyze. I wouldn't put a lot of faith in this one. 
Uh, we expect 6.9, you did 5.5. That's less than average, uh, same for 2002. I, you know, this one's so varied, it's very difficult to tell you what it really means. <laughs> Total sales, we expect 96.5 million, you did 104.2 in 2001. That's 7.7 .7 million better than average. And 2002, we expected 99 million, you did 110 million. So you're up uh, nearly $6 million from the previous year, and your surplus are, compared to other towns your size, you're up about 11 million. So uh, even though you have some weak areas, you have some very strong areas, and the balance goes to the plus side. So overall, uh, you're ahead of the game, or ahead of most towns your size. Uh, if we trace some of these categories, uh, here's food stores, for example. <coughs> uh, this is a pull factor sell in 70, 1976, selling to 175% of the town population and remained pretty steady. Kind of went down, then zoomed up here to, uh, you're selling to the equivalent of about 275% of the town population. It's always possible somebody can be misclassified. We, um, in the past, we could track this down. Now the state, somebody complained, there's, I think. Uh, what I'm saying is, in the past, we've always had a list of every business in every town, not the sales. They wouldn't give us the sales, which is confidential. But we were able to see when stores were obviously misclassified and get it straightened out. I think somebody complained, and uh, now they will not give us, as of this year, will not give us uh, how a store is classified any longer. Just to give you an example of how bad it can be, all the Kmart stores in the state of Iowa were classified as variety stores until we come upon, found it out, and then we complained to the Department of Revenue, and they changed them all to general merchandise sale, uh, stores, is where they should have been. So it really distorted the variety store category, which we think of as five and dime stores primarily. Um, so. I, it could be we got a misclassification here. It's uh, unusual to see that bigger rise, but maybe you folks will agree with that. I don't know uh, whether your grocery stores are that strong or not, but that's a tremendous increase. Uh, if we look at utilities, um, uh, we do tax utilities. We're phasing out that tax, by the way. Uh, we're in the second year of the phase out, thank goodness. Uh, it's a, a terrible re regressive tax. Um, and it accounts for a huge amount of the state sales tax, by the way, but uh, it had been growing up. I, I'm guessing uh, there was one year when they weren't collecting here in town and weren't collecting as much. We had a big drop there. It's back up to where it should have been. Uh, if we look at general merchandise, uh, I'm guessing that Walmart must come into the town about 1986. Is that correct? Uh, you can see how it jumped up there and then kind of has gone back down again as competition has come in around uh, the area. Here's building materials. At one point back in the 80s, you were selling to 165% of the town population, but it's dropped way down to 50% now. So that's that's a quickly re deteriorating category for you. If we look at some of the others, uh, eating and drinking has uh, not set the world on fire. In fact, it's been declining lately uh, to the point where, in fact, you're really not selling to any more than just the town population equivalent-wise. Uh, this red one is home furnishings. Uh, when you see a spike like that, you can just about bet there's a data error. Sometimes we can track it down, sometimes we can't. It's somebody recorded something else in there instead of what they should have recorded and saw it. I'm guessing that probably, just forget that, this probably goes right on down here. And we're down here now, so home furnishings went from, I'm going to say, the peak of selling to 125% of the town population down to uh, probably 20%. The yellow is apparel stores. Back when I first started coming over here, selling to nearly 200% of the town population, now we're down to about um, 30%. And uh, motor vehicles. This is only the parts and service uh, in auto stores, uh, but it's pretty strong for you. It's been generally rising, dropped off a little bit, but uh, selling to 150% of the town population. If we look at the last few here, especially stores, the card and gift shops and so on, generally rising. Went from 125% uh, back in 76 to maybe 175% today. The yellow is services, and it had de been declining, but the last few years have been pretty good. Jumped back up now to 130% or so. And the red is that wholesale, which doesn't mean all that much. The change between 2001 and 2002, the big losers were home furnishings, down 1.2 million, eating and drinking down 400,000, wholesale down 715,000. The big pluses were food up 1.7 million, 1.8 million, um, especially up nearly a million. Um, general merchandise up 600,000, building materials up nearly uh, 565 million, or thousands, I'm sorry, services up about 470,000. Are those uh, adjusted for uh, inflation also? 
No, that's just from one year to the next. There's no adjustment for inflation. It's just between 2001 and 2002. So. <laughs> Uh, just to summarize what we found uh, as we went through, the strongest category is specialty stores, 112 percent above average. The food category is the next strongest at 65 percent above average for towns of this size. Services, you know, the, everything up to the motels and hotels, uh, up 49 percent better than average. Um, weakest category is home furnishings, 75 percent below. Apparels, 43 percent below average. Wholesales 25%, uh, building materials is 16% below average. General merchandise 5% below. Overall, however, the gains um, outweighed the losses, so overall we're ahead of in total sales compared to other towns of this size by about 11%. Just to compare you to a few other towns around, um, looks like the smaller towns like Brighton and Eldon. The white bar is the actual sales, the red bar is what would be average for towns of that size. So they're below average, uh, but everybody else is a little above average. But keep in mind, they're all being compared to towns of their size. So even Kiyosakwa is better than average for towns of its size. Yes? What category stores like Orsons and I think they're, they should be in the wholesale category. But uh, only the taxable stuff that they sell is counted. So farm machinery itself is exempted from the um, sales tax. But there would be a lot of stuff in an Orsons, for example, that would be taxable. So that they, they are probably in the, that's where they should be, is in the coal sale category. And that's one reason we really regret the fact the state has shut us out from getting how people are classified now, because we, we've straightened these out many times. For years, I used to go up to Spencer, and they all, uh, the, the uh, people, we always showed a leakage in building materials. And one of the big building materials dealers would come up to me and just cuss me out every time I was there, saying, that's not right. I alone do that much, blah, blah, blah. Uh, finally, I got the list out and found that he was classified as a uh, auto supply store. <laughs> and so uh, once he got that straightened out, then everything fell in place. But uh, the reason these classifications can get off is that when you send in your application for a sales tax permit, it's a very short form, and you just state mainly what you're going to be selling. And some clerk down there classifies you. Well, if they've had a bad day or don't know what you're talking about or whatever, they may just completely misclassify you. So we had a kind of a check on that when we had the classification numbers, but now we don't have them. <laughs> we don't have any more. So at any rate, Tom was an 800 pound gorilla here, I guess. Uh, here's um, their actual sales. Here's what would be average for towns the size of Tumwa. So they're up in the uh, approaching $300 million sales. Uh, here's Mount Pleasant and you folks. I'm off to the side. I can't see very well, but around the $100 million category. And then these smaller towns, of course, are very, the lockers doesn't even show up. It's so small. Yes? Well, I'm surprised at Washington uh, being actual sales more than expected. After the, the first series of slides showed Washington as a, as a real drain going into the mall. Yeah. Uh, Washington's still doing better than expected, even with having lost all that. Yeah, this may be a little misleading because uh, we take into consideration uh, income and all that, so I'm not sure what the income level is over it, but just take an example. If we get a town that's got a relatively low income, then that adjusts their expected sales way down, and, and, if, and so it could very well be to show up as being above average. Uh, we're saying if people make less money, they're going to spend less money. So I'd have to look into this a little more detail to find out exactly what it is, but uh, it's something like that. I'm really interested in Washington. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll, we'll go on to the next subject then. Uh, let's just uh, kind of uh, summarize what we saw in terms of each of these merchandise categories. Uh, we show Fairfield at 9,500 population, kind of in the middle of uh, these towns we compared you with, and uh, this is your pull factor. You're selling 56% to 56 percent of the town population in building materials, to 125 percent of the population in general merchandise. So you're selling the equivalent of everybody in town plus 25 percent more. The big one is food, selling 273 percent. You might look at the averages for this category, 188 percent would be average for food. Now you can see how food's being concentrated in towns of this size, uh, county seat towns, but you know they get two or three good grocery stores, they pull people in from quite a distance. Uh, apparel, not very good, They're selling to 33% of the town population. Home furnishes is even worse, selling to 17%. Eating and drinking, selling 95%, specialty 175 
services 136, wholesale 63, and overall selling to 120% of the town population. Average is 123. This does not take into consideration the income situation. So uh, let's show how you rank then. Can you go back on that for a second? Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering about uh, mm -hmm. the foods and services where we're uh, below one on one. I mean, you know, how can that be? Eating and drinking? I mean, people aren't leaving Fairfield to go to Kiyosaka to eat. Well, if they go to the mall at Coralville, for example, there's a good chance they might eat a meal there that they wouldn't have, would have eaten here. <laughs> you see what I mean? Okay. Uh, there's that type of thing that happens. Um, oh. uh, let's rank you then. Uh, your best category is food. You rank second among all these towns. Uh, probably the next best category is specialty, ranking fourth. Overall, you rank 11th. Number one town is Spencer. Number two town is Carroll. Why do you think Carroll's so good? And uh, Decora here, uh, let's see. Decora ranks number four. Why do you think Decora and Carroll are such strong towns for towns of this size? <laughs> yeah, uh, geography explains it all. <laughs> they have a, a huge trade area. They're just at the optimal distance between major, I mean, you go to Decora, it's a long ways to get to any place else to shop. <laughs> And uh, you go to Carroll and, and there too, it's a long ways to get to, uh, to, get to uh, uh, Omaha or Des Moines or whatever. You, you're pretty far away actually. So, and plus they've been pretty aggressive in their retail sectors. Okay, uh, uh, probably the worst categories then are apparel and eating and drinking and um, home furnishings. Those three are pretty tough categories. That, there ought to be some opportunities for somebody to revive those, I would think. Um, that's down toward the bottom of the pack in those categories. Some demographics. Jefferson County had $241 million worth of spendable income. It's called EBI, Effective Buying Income. You probably know it better as disposable income, the amount of money people have left to spend after the taxes and withholding are taken out. Um, we spent about half that on retail, by the way. So uh, the median household income almost $30,000. That means that's right in the middle. Half the households have more, half have less. Statewide, it's 30, a little less than $35 million. 20, uh, nearly 30 percent of the households have less than $20,000. Statewide, it's 24. Um, 20 to $35,000 households, you have 28 percent, slightly higher than the state average. 35 to $50,000 households, 21 percent versus uh, pretty much the same as the state average. 50,000 over households, 21%, quite a bit lower than the state average. Average income per person is 92% as high as the state average. You can compare it to other towns around. For example, Keokuk County, very, a relatively low uh, average income there, 70% as high as the state. Uh, population, 16,000 in Jefferson County, less than 18 years of age, 27% versus 28 statewide. 18 to 24 years of age, 15% versus 19. This is a critical category right here. This is, uh, if you don't have a college or something, you tend to lose people. Well, that's actually graduates. Uh, well, that's where they're in college. <laughs> you tend to lose people in that category if you don't have jobs or college. 25 to 34 years of age, you have 44% versus 37. That's a good category for you. 35 to 49, 14%, not a slightly lower than the state average. And then uh, you have 6,600 households an average of, I didn't get the percent, but it's, I'm going to guess about 2.6 persons per household, probably. And then uh, lastly, uh, well, almost lastly, 100 and, uh, we, ex we think the people in the county spend about 144 million, 138 million were spent in the county. So that's a leakage out of the county of about 5.9, in spite of the fact that, uh, that Jefferson is um, doing pretty well. And uh, Fairfield, I'm sorry. Um, I'm trying to think of two things at one time here. So it's about a 4% leakage, like losing 663 full-time customers. Here's the way the leakage chart looked for Jefferson County. It was decreasing, then it really went in the dumper back in the early 90s and really climbed out fairly rapidly. And in fact, we had a couple of years of where you showed a surplus of sales in Jefferson County. Uh, 2001 was kind of a break-even year, and then now we've got a little leakage of about 5%. So. We hope that trend doesn't start back down here again. We hope that you take it back up here to the yellow again. But uh, you can see, uh, that's, uh, we seldom see this. Once this starts, it usually doesn't come back. We usually re 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 stay at a pretty big leakage. But you actually reduce the leakage rather substantially during the 90s. 
Uh, okay, that's the end of, the, of that. Um, I'm running ahead of time, I think, here. Uh, the last part I've got is uh, some possible, uh, are you asking a question or are you just stretching? <laughs> okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Sorry about that. I wasn't picking on you. <laughs> anybody uh, have any questions over what we've covered? Uh, well, the next part then is some general ideas about what you can do uh, to help out downtown. And, and I, you know, I have to start this off with almost an apology because I don't think any of us have the answer. It's, just, it's very difficult to know how you keep downtowns viable, how you grow them again, and so on. Uh, if I knew the answer to that, I'd be a fairly rich person today, but it just, uh, it's extremely difficult. So I'm going to offer several ideas that I've seen implemented in various places and that people talk about and so on. So uh, I, I view it as a two-pronged approach. Uh, I think, uh, number one, you've got to have cooperative actions, things that you can all do together in conjunction with the city, perhaps, or the chamber, or the, um, what do you call the new <laughs> the, if we, the Visitors Bureau? If you, have, if you had a Visitors Commission, Visitors Bureau, whatever, um, working together as a group with those kinds of organizations are, are things that, um, and we'll talk more about this in just a moment. So things you can all do together, and then next, things that those of you who are retailers or other business people can do individually to make your business better. And I really categorize the last thing as just getting back to the basics of doing good business. There are just so many businesses that have gotten sloppy in how they do their, their business with customers. And it's not just small businesses. Uh, you look at Kmart as an example. Uh, what happened to Kmart to cause them, get them in such dire straits? They just they made a lot of just stupid errors, didn't they, uh, by their management, but they just never, uh, you walked into a Kmart and you didn't get the kind of service, uh, things were out of stock, uh, you had trouble with returns, all kinds of problems that you didn't have typically with Walmart and Target. And so consequently, uh, it pretty much did them in, although they're coming out of Chapter 11, but it's going to uh, remain to be seen as to how things go. But uh, you can name probably any number of big companies where you've seen people not doing the job the way they are. I fly United mainly, not, I, I thought the world of them for the longest time, but uh, there was a period of time back in the last few years, they got pretty bad. <laughs> and even, uh, even though they're in Chapter 11 now, as recently as just a couple months ago, you know, a person they had at, at the frequent flyer counter at, in Des Moines, for example, I hope nobody in here is related to this person. <laughs> He was the grouchiest, nastiest person. Not the type of person you want to in front of people, but there he was, representing a big corporation. You know, we just, that's what I'm talking about. The little things that cause a company to, to lose its uh, luster, so to speak. Okay, uh, let's talk about some of these cooperative actions then. Uh, new and exciting promotions. A lot of towns kind of get into um, ruts, I guess I would say do the same thing over and over at the same time every year. And uh, some people like that, but some people like to see some new things and uh, something that would get the customers stirred up a little more and get them uh, excited about shopping in your town. Um, maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A session here in a minute. Uh, a loyalty program? I don't know about this. I, I'm, I used to think maybe this was an answer, but anybody know about Grinnell? They, they tried a loyalty a card system of some kind, and uh, uh, frankly, I, I can't see any results on the sales tax figures. Um, they thought they were going to see big results, but I have not seen much yet at this point. Um, you know about grocery stores that have a card that you get so much off of and so on. Um, that's why I'm talking about something like that, but it could be for the whole town. You have a card that, that could hopefully be electronic, that every time you, I mean, in the simplest case, you probably all had cards where if you bought so much gasoline, you finally got a free so much. Or I used to go, for, buy my dog food from Earl May, and if I bought, every time I bought, I got a punch on this little card. And when I got 10 punches, I got a free bag of dog food. Well, that was an incentive for me to keep going back to Earl May. And, and something like that for the whole town, I think, would be uh, pretty good. But here you've got to have the cooperation of most of the merchants, and, and that's the big problem we have, is getting them to cooperate on these things. So uh, you might want to consider something like that. Uh, opening hours. Well, this is such a can of worms, I <laughs> hate to even bring it up, but uh, it, and it's not just Fairfield or Iowa, or it's, it's all over the United States. It's all over the world, actually. Um, 
I can't tell you the number of places I've been, even tourist places where stores closed before tourists could even get a chance to get in there. My wife and I were in Christchurch, New Zealand uh, uh, a few years ago. I was doing some seminars there. And this was a tourist town if there ever was one. And there were literally hundreds of tourists out on the sidewalk. I can distinctly remember walking down the sidewalk at 4.45 in the afternoon. And I started hearing click, clack, click. Uh, what's going on? And the darn merchants, even though they were supposed to stay open until 5, which I thought was too early, were actually closing their stores at 4.45, getting ready for the, <laughs> shutting people out so they could really be out of there by 5. Uh, that's no way to do business. I mean, you had all kinds of potential customers out there. Well, the problem nowadays is that uh, we have so many households, especially younger households, that have dual income families. You have both partners working outside the household, and, and many just simply can't do business if you're going to close at 5.30 or, or whatever. And so um, you're basically shutting out about, I'd say, roughly half of the potential customers. If you don't stay open at the hours, they can get there. And so uh, that solves part of the mystery as to why people are going elsewhere to shop. So uh, what's the answer? There's no easy answer. Ideally, you'd like to have uh, the majority of the merchants agree to some extended opening hours, maybe an extra hour each evening. And I know it's tough being a small merchant. Um, I grew up in a family that uh, ran a small store, and it's, it's very difficult. You like to have some time off, too. But I would say my dad was always very accommodating as a farm machinery dealer. And he made it known that I don't care if it's Sunday night or when it is. If you've got a breakdown, you need a part, you come and get me out of bed or whatever. And, so he was very accommodating. People knew that would work. Um, but what we have many times is um, towns will try different things. <laughs> when I first came to Ames, for example, um, the stores weren't open in the evening. And then uh, they got together and said, OK, we're going to stay open Thursday night. So they tried it for about three weeks. And no, that's not working. So they quit that. And so then uh, you know, went by a few months, and then they had another meeting in the minds. No, we're going to stay open Friday night. And they tried that for a few weeks. No, that's not working football games and so on. So um, finally, in Ames, anybody know Ames very well, uh, they really had to come to, come to well, <laughs> whoever it is. <laughs> they had a serious meeting, let's put it that way. And uh, they actually got merchants to sign a, an agreement. They would stay open on, they decided to be Monday night, which I don't think is a very good night. But that's beside the point. They got uh, over half the merchants downtown signed an agreement they would stay open on Monday night till 8 o'clock or 8.30, I'm not sure which it is. And they would do it for one year. And most of them did it, and it stuck with Ames. And so downtown Ames, even though it's kind of deteriorated over the years, is still fairly active on Monday night because most people know they're serious about it now. They really are going to stay open on Monday night. We've got one night we can go down there and shop. So um, it takes something like that. It, I, I've about given up on it, however, uh, because there are just too many merchants that will say, are you crazy? Uh, they don't call me an independent merchant for no reason at all. <laughs> and uh, uh, we actually had a, a merchant in our town who closed on Christmas Eve at noon. Um, and everybody wrote to the paper to complain. And he wrote a nasty letter back saying that very thing. You guys just don't get it, do you? I'm closing at noon because I'm independent and I can do it. And that's what I'm going to do and so on. I mean, it just threw in our faces, basically. And, uh, in spite of the fact that we have a hard time getting even a majority to stay open, I have individual merchants across the country that come up to me and say, well, I could see that I wasn't going to make it if I didn't stay open extra hours. For example, I was doing a seminar in New Mexico uh, a couple years ago, and it started at 6 o'clock. And about 7.15, this guy comes in, and he's all kind of flustered and embarrassed, and, and we had a break shortly thereafter, and he came up and apologized, and he said, you know, I'm a jewelry dealer, and he said, uh, a merchant, and he said, my wife and I uh, run this jewelry store, and things just weren't going the way we thought they ought to be. And he said, we could see that a lot of the young people buying jewelry just simply couldn't get there when we were open. So we started staying open until 7 every, every night, he said. And he said, I just finished selling a wedding set, for example. And he said, that's the reason I'm late. And he said, most of our business now takes place between 5.30 and 7 o'clock. So I could tell you dozens of cases where individuals are making work. But I do know that some of you probably wouldn't see a payoff on it. But boy, it's, uh, there's so much synergism that would set in if we could get several to do it rather than just one or two. So that's my story on that. I, I've given up uh, all over the world. It's a problem. My wife and I were in Sweden, Stockholm once. And we were going to buy some of the famous Swedish crystal before we came home. Well, we weren't paying much attention to opening hours. And the night before we would come home, we were going to go to this uh, Swedish store. And heck, they'd closed like at 6 o'clock or something like that. But there was an Indian couple 
uh, from India that uh, were selling, they had, a, and they were staying open until like 11 o'clock, so it, guess where we bought it? So, I mean, the real entrepreneurs figure out uh, ways of making things go. Anyhow, um, I, I doubt, don't know if this is a problem downtown, but uh, many towns, the downtown parking really is a problem. And uh, just take uh, Nevada, Iowa, as an example. It's our county seat. Um, I have had people come in from eastern Iowa every so often to see me, and many times they'll take a swing through Nevada, and, and several have mentioned to me, boy, that Nevada, that is a dynamic looking town. I bet their sales are just gangbusters. Well, they're not. They're, they're among the lowest for towns of their size around. But it appears that things are going gangbusters. And why? Because every parking place is full. And why is that? My youngest son worked over there for one year for an abstracting office. There were six people worked in the abstracting office. <coughs> Guess where they parked? All six parked right in front of the store. And uh, so you take non-retail stores like that, that and, and others, uh, retail stores too, where everybody's parking right in front. It, it's not fair to the customer. You're going to run the customers off, I guess I would say. So uh, whether it's a problem here or not, I don't know. I'm just offering this as a problem in some places. Uh, recruiting new businesses. Uh, this is difficult. It's hard for a chamber to approach new businesses to come to your town. It's hard to find businesses that would come to your town. Uh, and yet there are some expanding businesses, maybe in the state or outside the state, maybe over in Illinois, that would dearly love to be in a place like this. One of the things we suggest, I presume the chamber has a website, is that correct? Okay. And sometimes the city has one. This retail trade analysis I just got through presenting to you, that is online. Every town in the state of Iowa, 500 population and above, we've got one online for them. And it has a unique URL. So I'm suggesting that each chamber link to that and say, here might show you some investment opportunities, uh, retail opportunities. And you can actually have a little editorial saying <laughs> there's some opportunities here, there, and the other place. The only problem you have is if you're recruiting businesses in an area where you've got existing businesses already in that area, sometimes they get ticked off at you. So I think you really owe it to them to go talk to them. Here's a good chance. Why don't you expand? If they refuse to expand, then I think it's a free game probably to start looking around for other businesses that will come in. Um, some more cooperative actions. I don't know if you got a revolving loan fund. I've come across a few towns that do, and it, it can uh, offer some, uh, maybe make the difference about getting a new business downtown or uh, for an expansion or whatever, or for a renovation of the outside of the building. And uh, I've seen this work pretty well, where it's administered pretty well. So uh, that's a possibility. Apparently you got one. Uh, the other thing I suggest is, Sometimes we get in a little bit of a zone, don't we? We kind of uh, think every, everything's fine here. <laughs> uh, we're doing as good as anybody this size, but I would suggest you pick out, look at my handout when you get it and see which, is, which are the best towns and go visit them. Get maybe uh, Bob and somebody, maybe you've done this already, uh, three or four or five, six people get in a van and, and make arrangements with the town and go visit and see what they're doing, uh, what's good about them, something you might be able to emulate. So. Um, that's worked for a lot of people also. Focus group studies. You know what I'm talking about here? Have you ever done one in Fairfield? Uh, we used to do these in Iowa State Extension all the time. We kind of quit doing them because they're pretty hard to do and we got so many people mad at us, <laughs> we decided it wasn't worth the effort. But uh, what we have done in the past is we'll come into a town like Fairfield and if we can get like 20 merchants to sponsor us, and this means they're going to pay like a hundred bucks a piece or something like that, to um, um, do a focus group study of what customers think of your business and the town. Uh, we will then work with some of the service clubs and so on to uh, establish, say, four groups of people we're going to interview. And we want them to be disparate groups, maybe a group of old timers, a group of newcomers to town, a group of farm families, maybe a group of youth even, teenagers or whatever. And we'll interview each group separately and maybe have eight persons to a group. We'll sit around the table like you're sitting at. Uh, we, uh, we start off by just asking general questions about where do you shop in general, what do you think about Fairfield, and what do you like about it, what don't you like about it. Then we zero in on every business that sponsored us and say, what do you like about Joe's Hardware Store, what don't you like about it. And they go around the table, each one says what they like or don't like about it and recommendations they might have. And uh, we tape record all these, but we promise anonymity. Then after the, we interview each of the four groups, and they're done separately, then we 
transcribe all the tape written, or the tape recorder uh, comments onto the written page and take out any comments that might indicate who said what to protect that anonymity. And then we consolidate the remarks for each business and go back and spend 20 or 30 minutes with them telling what people had to say. But you've got to have thick skin to do this, typically, because there's always a few people in there that's going to make some <laughs> bad remarks about you. But, but we've seen more meaningful changes from this than anything we've done. But I don't highly recommend it in that it's a lot of trouble. A lot of uh, people do get mad at us because they'll say, I'm not, our store's not that way at all. It's just people thinking we're that way. <laughs> well, if people think you're that way, <laughs> you're that way, you know? So uh, at any rate, uh, just to give an example, I did one uh, once in North Central Iowa, and there was this nursery in town, lawn and garden and nursery, primarily a nursery. Everybody loved the couple that ran it. It was a middle-aged couple. They said, you know, they're great people, and that man knows everything there is to know about cultural practices, plant disease, and so on and so forth. They said, the problem is he won't come up front and talk to us. He spends all his time back in the back with the plants. So I thought, this is going to be real simple. So I, when I debriefed him, I just recited what I recited to you. And, and the, the guy jumps up, and his face turns red, and he says, well, hell, don't they know I've got work to do? I don't have time for customers. Well, you know, he genuinely believed that the plants in the back were more important than the people in the front. And, and if you all listen to call-in shows like on weekends where there's a, a horticulturalist or somebody that really knows about plants and so on, there's just a huge desire for that knowledge out there. And here this guy was, had it but wouldn't give it to his customers. And we subtly convinced him that he had a great talent that people desired. Maybe he could hire somebody to help him water and prune and he could spend more time in front. And, and it worked out that way. But uh, you wouldn't believe the people that we've run across that were doing things that people didn't like, but the people wouldn't tell the store owner or manager. But when a third party like us told them, then sometimes we could engender some, some changes. And so uh, you do have to have thick skin. Sometimes it's completely positive. Everybody loves you. They don't want to change anything. But more than likely, there's some things they don't like. And, and uh, it can be something as simple as uh, a man one time we interviewed, he ran a women's clothing store. He and his wife did. But he stood in the front smoking a cigar, or no, a pipe. And you can imagine what the clothes must have smelled like. And uh, the women in town just highly resented it. And uh, but finally, uh, he, he, hadn't, he didn't have a clue that he was offending people by smoking that pipe in the front of the store. And so, you know, just simple things like that that you can really see some changes on. So I'm not promoting this in a big way, but uh, it's something that you might want to consider. Uh, unique stores. And I think Fairfield probably has done as good a job at this as any town your size in the state. You really do have a lot of diversity here. You really do have a lot of unique stores. And by the way, if anybody else has to get up and leave, that's fine. I'm not going to bite you or anything. So, um, Develop tourism and recreation resources. I'm absolutely convinced that people in the Midwest are starved for recreational and tourism opportunities. Um, why else would gambling be as ragingly popular as it is, for example? I mean, uh, from the standpoint of the casino operators, you'd have to say it's been a roaring success, has it not? I mean, we're losing over a billion dollars a year as, <laughs> as customers. And uh, I don't like it, but uh, there are a lot of people that love it. But I think that, uh, by and large, in this state, up until recently at least, we've done a poor job of developing tourist opportunities. If you just take celebrities alone, we have got tons of them from this state, yet well, we say there'll be a little sign once in a while, somebody's birthplace, John Wayne's birthplace, or somebody. But we've not done a lot in really developing it or promoting it. And, and I just think uh, there's tremendous opportunity in that category. Pella is a good example. When I first came to Iowa, and you, you, all, you older people all remember that probably, uh, the tulip time, the one weekend per year, was pretty much it. And then as shortly thereafter, they started realizing, hey, we've got a tourist attraction here, the Dutch theme and so on. Perhaps we could get bus tours in, and uh, I don't know how many bus tours per, maybe you know Bob, but they have a lot of bus tours go through there, a big share of the year now. And it's been a huge injection of um, business into Pella, I believe, uh, especially for some of their specialty stores. But I do believe we're making progress in this, in this uh, area. I, I spoke to the Western Iowa Tourism Association or something, and I sat through some of their sessions. I was really impressed with some of the things they're doing. They've got some great promotional brochures and things now, and, and I think we're making progress. So uh, I think we need to take a look and see what we can improve in this category. Uh, interesting things connected to, perhaps to Maharishi. I don't know uh, what all is going on there and so on, but uh, anything that you've, that you've got that uh, is prominent in your town that you can tail, tag on to is going to be important. Now some of the individual actions. 
Um, if you're going to be in business and be successful, you've got to have a competitive advantage. In other words, in the minds of the customer, there has to be something better about your place of business than your competitors. Have you ever stopped to think about, why do you bank where you do, for example? Something better about it in your mind. Maybe they're friendlier. Maybe they have better, uh, less fees on their checking, uh, or ATM, or whatever. Uh, maybe uh, they just treat you a lot better. Can, uh, why do you shop at the grocery store you do? I shop at the one I shop at simply because it's the closest. I don't think it's the best in town, but it's the closest. So we have various reasons we shop at where we do, but you better have some competitive advantages in your place of business, otherwise you're not going to make it. If the customers don't believe that you're better in some way, they're not going to shop at your place or do business with you. Oh, well, let's go back to the next one. Try to find a niche. If you had to use one word for, for strategy, it would be niche. That's something you can do better than anybody else or something you can do that nobody else is doing. And uh, I'll give you an example in Ames. There's a jewelry store in Ames that uh, started out shortly after I got to town. And initially, they were just trying to go head to head with the chain jewelers. And they were failing. They were not doing very well, let's put it that way. As they went to uh, jewelry shows, they started hearing about people that were designing settings, for example. And this guy's pretty creative. He said, I think I could do that. So he started off in silver, designing settings. And he'd buy gemstones and put in the settings. And um, am I saying that right? The setting is a thing that sets in, I guess so. Um, and that took off pretty well and gradually branched off into gold and, and he has got a land office business now. What you buy in that store is unique. Or you can actually take a drawing to him. If you've got a 25th wedding anniversary coming up and you want a special ring design, for example, um, he will design it and build it for you. Um, that's a niche. Um, so, um, and then shopping your competition. Uh, I get so aggravated, I do Walmart seminars all over the country and all over the world, actually. And when I ask um, merchants here competing against Walmart in various places, have you ever been in a Walmart store? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, isn't that like operating in a vacuum? If you, ha if you don't know what your biggest competitor is doing, how, how in the world can you compete against them? And in, in the book I wrote in, uh, a few years ago, I used Joe Paterno, the Penn State coach, as an example. Uh, I don't think Joe Paterno or, or any good coach would ever allow their team to play another team unless they scouted them got all the tapes, preview the tapes, review the tapes, let the players see the tapes, look for all the weaknesses in the other team, and so on, strengths too. But here we've got local merchants not going to the competition for whatever reason. And sometimes it's things as simple as, well, I wouldn't want to be seen in my competitor's store. <laughs> well, maybe if it's uh, you know, a, a, in your town, it's uh, another small store. Perhaps that's true. But if it's a bigger store, certainly I wouldn't have any qualms about it. So anyhow, uh, I think. You really got to get out and shop the competition. For prices, uh, displays, maybe you'll find some good ideas you might be able to use. Uh, certainly on this prices thing, you wouldn't want to be, you want to find out if you're in a ballpark or not. And the kind of policies they have on the returns and things of that nature uh, that you might want to try to meet or exceed, so to speak. And the voids they might have in their merchandise mix that you might be able to fill. Some other things, uh, individual actions, uh, buying well. Uh, if you're, um, I'm speaking of merchants now primarily, it, you can't sell well unless you buy well. And outfits like Walmart, for example, have huge advantages in buying. They're so big, they've completely changed the equation in the way stuff is manufactured and sold. If you go back 30, 40 years ago, manufacturers or producers kind of decided by surveys and so on what the public wanted. They designed whatever it was, they produced it, they sold it to a distributor and then down to a wholesaler and finally to a retailer and actually told them what it should sell for. Today, outfits like Walmart or Home Depot or whatever are so big, they decide what they want. They decide what price they're going to pay and maybe even some of the features of construction and so on. And they uh, dictate even such things as the, uh, um, the, the terms of the sale and so on. Uh, I'll give you a little side story just to show you how dominant these stores have become. A few years ago, I was doing a seminar out at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. It was plant growers, people that grew trees and shrubs and bedding plants to sell to retailers. And I just got going real well, and some guy held up his hand. He said, say, I sold a bunch of stuff to Walmart last year, and said they paid me. And then after the season's over, they sent me a letter saying they'd had such a bad year, they wanted 3% of their money back. Now, keep in mind, this is a retailer telling a supplier, <laughs> I want 3% of my money back. 
Those of you who are retail, how many, who's a retailer in here? Hold up your hand. Okay. Would you ever go back to your supplier and say, hey, I had a bad year, give me 3% of my money back? I don't think so. Uh, so um, at any rate, I said, well, did you give it back? And, yeah. <laughs> Two, three other people held up their hands. Yeah, it happened to me too. I gave it back. When I walked out of the auditorium when the seminar was over, the, the organizer put his arm around me as if to say, poor ignorant guy, they all got that letter. And he said they all gave it back. Well, the register did a story on Walmart back a, a few months ago, and they got a, some quotes from me, and I, it happened to be, we talked about this subject, and that was in the paper. Well, the next day, a grower just 40 miles from Ames, who grows plants and sells to Walmart, called me. He said, yeah, you're right on the 3%. He said, I gave it back. He said, it's gotten a lot worse since then. He said, now they're dictating the terms of the sale. He said, it used to be 30 days net. Then they said, okay, now it's 45 days net. You all know what that means. You pay in 30 days or you pay interest. Uh, he said, then they went to 60 days net. He said, then two days ago, I got a letter from them saying, not only is it 60 days net, but it's retroactive to 1999. Now, this is 2003. It's retroactive to 1999, and you owe us $6,000, $7,000 now. I mean, how much more dominant can you be? So you independent merchants have a devil of a time <laughs> coming close to that. However, <clears throat> there is hope um, in cooperative buying with uh, other with buying groups and so on. You can get some good buys. Frankly, there's a surplus of virtually all merchandise today. There's just more than can be sold. So there, there are some real, some real good deals out there. There are liqu there's liquidated merchandise from uh, uh, retail chains that have gone out of business. Um, there's uh, overrun merchandise, stuff that were a, a manufacturer just had nothing else to do, so they just kept making stuff, and they, to get rid of it, they sell it for reduced prices. So these things are available, but you really have to look around <coughs> and, and uh, just don't take the first price that is given to you, so to speak. Excuse me just a minute while I wet my throat a little bit. Okay, we're going to zip on through this. Get rid of the dogs. What do you think I mean by that? <laughs> Most every retailer has some kind of merchandise around that they bought thinking, oh, this is going to really go great. And maybe it's a fad at the time or whatever, and, and maybe the fad is over the time you got it on the shelf. And so you end up with this stuff sitting there this year, next year, and the year after, and so on. And, and uh, what is wrong with that? Space yeah, exactly. It's just like money sitting there deteriorating in value. And on top of that, it gets dusty, it gets faded, it starts making your place look bad. Because you're there every day, you may not notice it, but to somebody just walking in for the first time, they definitely can notice it. And uh, a few years ago, I was out in New York State, and there was a chain called James Way out there, a discount uh, department store chain like Walmart, Kmart, 300 and some stores, they're gone now. But at the time, they were open, and I was milling around in the store and found a display of Fram oil filters. What colors Fram oil filters boxes in? Yeah, they're bright orange, aren't they? Most of them are bright orange, but a little section were kind of a tan color, like a few blouses I see around here. And uh, I looked at them more closely, had dust on them. And I was really curious at that point, why would this little section be tan colored? And I looked in the reference manual to see what they were for, and they were like for a, a Nash Rambler that was 25 years old or something like that. I, I can't remember the exact details, but uh, why would you have something like that around? And, so, you know, you got to get rid of that stuff and bite the bullet and mark it down, do whatever you have to do and put something on there that'll move. I get after grocers all the time. In the past, they've had a six foot section of name brand motor oil at $2 a quart. Maybe I've seen as high as $3 a quart. Who's going to buy that stuff when they go to Walmart and get it for a buck? You know, it's just, anyhow. Um, sharpen your pricing skills. Um, do you think Walmart's cheaper on everything than every other store? Everyday low prices. Everyday low prices. You hear that all the time, don't you? Well, many things they are. There's no question about it. But they're smart enough to know, and, they, and they're masterful at this, that the average person really doesn't know the going price of very many things. How many things do you think we know the going price of? The average person. Not very many. They used to say 250. Now I think I'm seeing more on the order of 100. I doubt that most of us know 100. Yes? Dollar General stores are helping on that because everything's 50 cents a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Walmart, I can tell. Yeah. Through there, uh, well, I'll get that down at Dollar General because it takes that cheaper. Yeah. And, uh, so that kind of thing does help us. I agree. But what we tend to know the price, there were things we buy frequently, 
paper products, pet food, if you have a young baby, uh, disposable diapers, milk, bread, gasoline, things of that nature. Um, Walmart, in their bigger super centers, has about 120,000 different items of merchandise. They're checking probably less than 1% of those items. In particular, they have an 850 list for their food, the food part of their super centers. And they're out checking the competition on those items. If they ever find a customer lower than them, a uh, store competitor lower than them on those, let's say, 1,000 items, the store manager has the authority to immediately lower the Walmart price to be the lowest in town, and where do they display them? At the entryway, in the, on the end caps, in the main aisles, in dump bins, and gondolas, and so on. So every time you walk into one of their stores, the things you tend to know the price of, you always see price lower, don't you? So then what do you assume? Everything else may, must be priced lower too, but it's not, um, not everything. I mean, if you bought everything there, you'd probably save a little money, but when you least expect it, you can pay more. I'll just give you an example. Um, light bulbs. If you take GE soft white light bulbs, the four packs, the regular ones, uh, from 40 watt to 100 watt, Walmart's regular price is $1.44, but uh, they will mark that down to be the lowest in town, and quite often you'll see them selling for 98 cents, for example. Um, so they're always going to be low on that. Now, how about a 150 watt bulb? They come in singles only. How do you think they rank on that? Well, I use them in my basement, and I've always been buying them at Walmart because I knew they were always low on these others, and I assumed they were on that, but it turns out that not many people use 150 watt bulbs. Not many people know the price of them. They have been at $1.98. <laughs> for as long as I can remember. And sometimes, like in Ames, a grocery store next door is selling for $1.47. <laughs> and uh, many, so in other words, Walmart knew they'd get by with selling that item for a higher price because most of us didn't really know the price and wouldn't bother to compare, just assuming that they were always low. So my advice to you is figure out what the 1% of the items in your stores are that are price sensitive, that people tend to know the price of, and be a, at least within 10 to 15 percent of the discount stores on those. And the rest of the things, I think, you know, take your regular markup on. So, and the other thing, make sure that you put your price tags on where people can see them. It just drives customers nuts when they can't find the price on things. Returns policies, I don't know. They're, uh, um, the big companies have spoiled us rotten, basically. Sears kind of started off with satisfaction, guarantee your money back, then Walmart and so on. But um, I think you just have to keep in mind that the old saying goes, it costs five times more to get a new customer than to, get, to keep an existing one. And so uh, maybe sometimes you do have to give up a little bit to satisfy a customer on a return. But we, we really need to try to do the best we can on those. So when you give them the runaround, that tends to run them off. <laughs> uh, training employees, it's really important. and. Uh, Sometimes we put employees out before the public, before they know the store's policies, before they know how to operate the cash registers, and so on. And in particular, customer relations, uh, how they treat customers. As, when you travel as much as I do, you, you can see it even in hotels. Some hotel chains, it's obvious, the, even the maids and everybody working in the places have had some kind of training in this. As, no matter if you meet them in the hallway or you meet them outside or wherever, they look you right in the eye with a smile and say, good morning, sir, how are you doing? You don't expect that, but when you see everybody doing it, you start feeling a little better. <laughs> As contrasted to those who, dies, eyes downcast, uh, say nothing, groaning, groaning about how bad a job it is and that type of thing. Um, so uh, we, this means a lot and we, we need to work on this, uh, this positive attitude and, and treating customers right and knowing company policies also. Okay, uh, some other things. I think most small businesses do offer exceptional service. They sh if they don't, they need to work on that. Uh, adopting modern technology. Um, I was called by the Des Moines Register here a few weeks ago about a drugstore in downtown Des Moines that was about to get a new Walgreens right next to it. This drugstore had been a neighborhood drugstore and made it quite well for several years. Uh, in the story, they talked about no, and they didn't have an answering machine. Uh, you got a live person there if you could get one, finally, on the telephone. Uh, they didn't have uh, any computers. They didn't have anything that was what I would call modern. Well, that might make it seem like an old-fashioned store and might be kind of folksy, but 
I contend that in today's age, you've got to keep up the technology. Scanners are affordable. Computers are affordable. If you learn how to use all these things, and uh, you can save huge amounts of money, actually. Um, well, I'm, I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to get into all the details of that. But know your financial statements. My PhD is actually in agricultural finance, and when I came to Iowa and found out I was going to be working with retailers primarily, I thought, boy, these people are going to love this stuff because I, I think it's great, you know. Well, I couldn't have been more wrong if I'd tried. <laughs> the average small business person hated financial statements. They didn't, it was kind of foreign to them, they didn't know much about it, and so they'd give it to a bookkeeper, an accountant, out of sight, out of mind. But the problem with that is, many times, by the time it became obvious something was wrong, it was too late, and sometimes your accountant really doesn't know your business that well anyhow. So um, I'm suggesting you really spend some time getting in touch with these things. A few years ago, I was to speak in Chicago to an international program of um, uh, using uh, uh, technology and retailing. And so I thought, before I go, I should get some ideas of what some local people are doing. So I called a grocer in northern Iowa who owns six grocery stores. I said, Joe, can you give me some ideas how you use technology in, in your business? And he said, no. And then we talked for a while and finally said, well, I can. He said, I've got these six stores and I get all these computer printouts, financial statements and so on. He said, in the past, I've always given the printouts for, from store A to manager A, printouts from store B to manager B and so on. He said. Never heard anything from anybody. He said, starting a little over a year ago, I started giving all six statements to each manager. You see the difference? Now each manager's got five other stores to compare his or her store to. He said, within a day, somebody called me and said, say, did you know one store's got utility costs uh, $25,000 higher for the year than any other uh, of the five other six stores? No, he never, nobody ever looked before. So they contacted the utility company, and they had actually made a mistake. They got $25,000 back. He said, another day went back by and somebody called and said, say, did you know one cash register in one of these stores has got five times the return rate of any other cash register? Now, these managers are really starting to look at this stuff now <laughs> when they had something to compare it to. And uh, he checked on that and found out that the guy, the young man running the cash register was in cahoots with another young man who was coming in buying a lot of stuff. And when he went out, they only checked out about half of it. And then he'd come back and return it and they'd split the money and so on. So, you know, just cursory examination of the financial statements allowed him to make some pretty good uh, changes. Uh, find ways to reduce operating costs. We all have to work on this all the time. We all know that. Developing teamwork by empowering employees. Do your employees have the authority to take care of business or not? I'll tell you my little horror story. <laughs> um, my wife and I owned a rental house f um, for several years, and we, actually a couple, and we bought uh, all the appliances from this one dealer in Ames, and we thought highly of him. So uh, time went by, and, and I, we didn't have much in the way of TV sets at the time, and I had a 19-inch TV set that went bad. So I took it to their repair department, this place where we bought all these appliances, a few thousand dollars worth of appliances, and uh, went back a few days later to get it. And when I went back to get it, the two young men working there couldn't find it, and they were getting mad at each other for losing it and so on, and I finally said, well, heck, I think this is it sitting right here on the counter, this one that's playing here. I said, oh, that one. I said, well, you must have jig jiggled it when you brought it in. And we turned it on. It worked fine. So we've been watching it ever since. And I said, OK, I'll take it home. Uh, they said, that'll be $20. And I said, uh, OK, here's my credit card. Nope. See the sign up there? It says it has to be at least $25 before you can pay for it with a credit card. I said, uh, I don't have any money or I don't have my checkbook. I have to go home. So I drove home 15 minutes. Came, took 15 minutes to get back. And the more I drove, the matter I got at the lunacy of this, you know. And uh, finally, when I got back with my checkbook, I said, did you guys adjust the focus or anything to earn the 20 bucks? No, but if you want that, it'd be another 20 bucks. Well, that, that did it. Uh, I, I blew my stack, and I haven't been back since. And that's not atypical of what a customer would do. What would have been a simple way of handling that? Take the credit card. I would have, I've been happy to be taking the credit card. Stupid not to take it for 25 when, for 20 when they said the minimum was 25. What would have been the simplest way to handle it? Yeah. Yeah, no charge. Hey, we didn't do anything. The next time you have a problem, bring it back to us. I would have, but I would have been happy even if they'd taken the, the credit card. But and I, when it was all said and done, I wasn't as, mad as, uh, wasn't as mad at the two young men as I was at their boss because I knew the boss and I knew he'd put them in a straitjacket. <laughs> He had set up some very stringent rules for them and told them, don't you dare break those rules. When 
we should say these are nominally the rules, but use your common sense for God's sakes. If somebody wants to do uh, credit for 20 bucks, take it if it's a good customer or whatever, you know, but give them a little authority, but uh, boy, <laughs> that's uh, something else. Uh, offering incentives, profit sharing for your people. Uh, I don't know, it's, we don't, m not many small businesses do this, so the bigger businesses do it. <coughs> Some lessons learned at Main Street I Ames. I'm not saying we have all the answers, but um, here's that jewelry store I was telling you about. Still calls himself Ames Silversmithing, even though he's primarily gold now. Here's a, the, uh, a men's clothing store, for example. But it's better stuff, it's a, it's a niche. Uh, here's another one. Uh, can't, that's, this was taken on a rainy day and it uh, didn't turn out too well. Uh, some shoe stores. Bet, all this stuff is uh, you know, better than what you could find uh, in a discount store and so on. So the downtown is offering something different from what you can find in the discount stores or perhaps the malls even. Uh, another shoe store. Another shoe store. <laughs> and they all coexist pretty well. My wife has spent, uh, I'm going to say, thousands of dollars, and you're going to think that's an overstatement, but I don't think so, <laughs> uh, on frames. You, you can't believe how much money you can spend on custom framing and when you buy as much uh, stuff as we do. But again, a, a different kind of shop, uh, and uh, another frame print shop. And uh, this used to be a car dealership, but now it is the most fantastic quilt store you can imagine. They have um, all their quilts displayed with all kinds of quilting materials in there, and they do a, a land office business. They have just moved, by the way. but. Uh, um, here's uh, an upscale cycle place. Uh, they, couldn't, they found they couldn't compete against Walmart and Kmart on the low-end bicycles at 35 bucks and so on, but they could have parts and service and handle $300 bicycles and $800 bicycles, and that's what they've done. They've apparently done pretty well. Uh, here's an outfit that sells upscale sewing machines. I didn't know you could spend 3500 or 4000 bucks for a sewing machine, but uh, you can. And, and that's what they handle, as well as repair and parts and lessons taught and so on. Um, and then here's um, Kirby vacuum cleaner. But you can see the downtown is basically a niche type downtown. They're, they're selling a lot of stuff that, that um, you couldn't compete against with the discount stores. Uh, more upscale cookware, uh, a different kind of pizza place. A different kind of, here's a local bookstore, actually it's a, it's a co-op, and here's an interesting pizza and steakhouse, and that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, sorry I've uh, gone on for so long, but uh, any comments or questions? You can see there's no set answer for any of this, but I would still believe if we could get more people cooperating to make the whole town better in various ways and promotions and so on, and then each and every merchant figure out some way to make my business better, the sum total then is a much better shopping district in a town like Fairfield and people start noticing that, hey, things have changed around here. Every business seems to be a little better than it was and we got different promotions, different, we got improved streets or whatever it happens to be. So comments or questions? Yes? Well, what effect do you see the bypass having on a town like Fairfield when it gets built? If you um, are dependent on transit traffic, motels for example, um, restaurants, things of that nature. Uh, it can be devastating if you don't put up the proper kind of signage. Uh, when uh, 163 first went around Pella, for example, the first time I went down that way, uh, I didn't realize I was already past town because I'd plan to stop by Jarzma's and, <laughs> and get some uh, Dutch letters and so on. And I was around town before I knew it. But that, at that time, they didn't have signage up. Now they have lots of signs up, and, and there's no question about where you get off to go into Pella. So signage is very important. Um, our studies have shown that overall, it doesn't make that much difference in terms of sales. But what it means is some of the ones downtown that were impacted may have gone out on the bypass or somebody else went out on the bypass. If you're not dependent on transit traffic, it's not a particular problem because everybody around the local area knows how to get to your store anyhow. But if, if you're dependent on transit traffic, it can be a problem, but it can be solved largely with signage, I think. So anybody else? Uh, Yes. I'm interested uh, for your perception on when you do this workshop in other communities. To look around the room here, I say probably 70% of the people here are in financial institutions. <laughs> and there aren't too many retailers, yeah. and the ones that I see here are already doing a lot of things <laughs> that you mentioned. Uh, That's uh, typical. almost typical, almost exactly as I find everywhere. 
Um, it's interesting because uh, one of the most common comments I hear is the people that really should have been here weren't here. The ones that are here are already doing what you are saying needs to be done. And um, I, I don't know. Um, I just don't know what the answer is. I don't know why it's that way, but it, it, this is pretty much typical what we will find everywhere. Once in a while you find a higher percentage of merchants, but not very often. <laughs> um, anybody got any other answers as to why that happens? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, anybody else? Uh, well, uh, here are the handouts. Maybe we should put them. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let Bob take care of that, but uh, I don't know if we've got enough for everybody, but uh, he can make more probably. And uh, um, that's just a, the retail trade analysis. All the rest of the slides, Bob does have a CD of it if you think you'd like. To, I don't know if he can make copies of CDs or not. I expect, can you make copies of CDs? Okay. Um, uh, our selected things on the CD or whatever. Um, oh, boy, I've caused you a lot of trouble now, haven't I? <laughs> Uh, at any rate, or if that fails, just give me a call and I can get whatever you need. I mean, I've got tons of stuff at home I haven't begun to unload on you, so. Uh, I do believe that we have made some progress on many of our towns like this. I do believe we're starting to figure out what it takes to keep uh, towns robust and so on, and I'm hoping that that keeps increasing because um, it's just a shame to let our what used to be really strong retail towns to kind of dissipate becomes towns that aren't very strong anymore. If you all know the multiplier effect, uh, for every d new dollar that comes into your town, that, uh, let's say in the way of wages, about 40% of that or so, if it should be rotated through the retail sector, if it does, it will turn over about five times and each new dollar will generate perhaps another 60 cents. Uh, so that's the multiplier effect. Conversely, for every dollar that leaves the town, Eventually, that same thing happens. It's not just a dollar leaves, but it's like a dollar sixty cents at least, because eventually, that the stores in town are going to have to lay off somebody. They're not going to do as much business in town, and so on. So, it's really important that we try to keep all the retail that we can. Oh, well, I guess I'm finished then. Let's. Uh, <laughs> I do appreciate you coming, and I hope you got something out of the seminar. And feel free to contact me if I can help you in any way.